what did the death on the cross do? His death on the cross enables us, brothers and sisters, women and children, boys and girls, to be able to live the kind of life that glorifies God. See, we're saved by grace, but grace is not a license to sin. Grace is the enabling, empowering ability of God in our life to help us to do what he's called us to do and to be what he's created us to be. For the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking forward to that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who have purified us, redeemed us from all iniquity, and purified unto us a peculiar people, zealous of good works, not to be saved, but because we are saved. And he gives us this power, and the cross gives us that power to live for him. Paul tried to explain it to the Galatians in Galatians 2 and 20, being harassed by Judaizers who were trying to get them to keep the law. Paul said it ain't about the law. He says this, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not I, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. You can only live for him if you have died in him. His death provided the power that we need to live a righteous life over sin and to give us power over all the power of the wicked one. And that's what we need right now, power over all the power of the wicked one. We already have it. We need to demonstrate, model, access, decree, declare that we have power over all the power of the wicked one. What did him dying on the cross do for us? Colossians 2.13. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. Here's what he did. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. On the cross, he he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. He triumphed over them, took everything that was against us, all of the stuff that the devil had on us, and nailed it to the tree. Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Somebody said, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Not just because of him on the cross, but I was there with him. My sins, he bore our sins and our griefs on that tree. And there he nailed them to the cross, forgiving us of all our sins. The cross broke the devil's back and set the captives free. Finally, finally, how did he do it? How? How did he? Doctors have examined this crucifixion, and modern doctors today have put verbiage to what could have possibly been going on in the body of Jesus. I've looked at this crucifixion so many times. Every time I think about it and I know the details, it causes me to tremble. I shudder. The weight is just so heavy, and so tonight, if you would just lean in, tonight, if you just allow me to try to reenact what happened on that night, on that cross even the last 12 hours as the movie the passion tried to depict let me just walk you through this what Christ was asked to do no other man could have done he was verily the God man this is called the hypostatic union This is how he was able to, even in that garden, say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, fully man. But nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done, fully God. The hypostatic union says he wasn't part God and part man. He was all man and he was all God. You cannot phantom that, I know. You can't figure it out, but that's the way God is. He's not to be figured out. He's to be believed on. For them that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. The word amplifies who he was. The word reveals who he was. You read the scriptures and it'll show you that he was Emmanuel being interpreted God with us. That's a great mystery for the Bible 
Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh. Oh, Isaiah prophesied that his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, that unto us a child is born and a son was given. His name is Jesus. He said to Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. In the beginning with the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Christ came. He came through 42 generations to do what no other man could do. He came through, and he walked through Adam, and he walked right by Enoch and walked right by Noah and walked right by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the judges, the prophets. Uh, none of them could do what he could do. And he came born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothing, lived a sinless, impeccable life, grew in stature and favor with God and man, was obedient unto death, even denied the death of the cross. The theaters gave it an R and restricted it for some viewers. But I give it an R for reality, and no one's restricted. It's for everybody. There are no words that exist that can really portray the extent of the suffering, starting with the mock trials, starting with them in the Kangaroo courts, in Caiaphas courts, in Pilate's courts, the Sanhedrin, the ones behind it all trying to find a way to get rid of this Messiah. They released a known criminal, which was the custom at that time. They said, we traditionally release one of your own at this time. Which one do you want, Jesus or Barabbas? And the people said, the same people who he walked among, he healed their sick, he raised their dead, he gave sight to their blind. The same Jesus, they said, away with him. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify. They wanted him dead. He never did anything to them. He didn't deserve to die. But they wanted a known criminal instead of him. They charged him for claiming to be the king of the Jews. So what did they do? They put a mock crown on his head. A crown of thorns. The hypodermic of the needles sticking down into his brow, causing the blood to ooze and to get into his eyes, his ears. The orifices on his face, his mouth begin to fill with the blood that read from the brow. The needles sticking into his central nervous system, his medulla oblongata, sending pain signals all over the place. They slapped him. They blindfolded him. They spit in his face. They pulled his beard. They tested his prophetical skills. They said, tell us who hit you. With a bag over his face, unable to see, they slapped him. Tell us who hit you. They mocked our Savior. They treated him. Then he was led away. Led away to be tortured. Beyond human explanation, I'm going to try. But it's hard. The, hard. the movie tried, but it didn't come close. They whipped him with a cat on nine tails, a leather strap with bone and metal in it. The bone was wrapped within the strap, and the metal was in it as well. These Romans were professional whippers. They could rake the strap across his back so that the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and leave quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh like the hem of the garment, the tassels on the end of the garment. So was his flesh dangling from his body. They would rip and they would tear. They would rip and they would tear. Try and imagine a whip that could strike the flesh that had these weighted balls of metal woven into it that would cause these deep bruises and contusions that would swell and burst the skin open when the sharp pieces of bone would cut the flesh and it's raked across the swellings. It's as easy as a razor, a razor blade going through salt butter. And they shrieked his back. It said that his back was so shredded that part of the spine could be exposed because of the deep, deep 
cuts and bruises, layers of skin and sinew and tissue ah, raked off of his back. Beaten from the shoulders down to the back of his legs with every nerve ending screaming, sending pain signals back to the brain to release the screams that accompanies this type of gruesome process. I told you he was uh, God and man. He did not not feel this. He wasn't impervious to pain. Can't you hear him? It hurts. Oh, he cried. He, he, it hurts. Oh, every stripe. Oh, somebody said 40 stripes saved one. These were Romans. They had no such law. They could have beat him until they were tired. The purpose was to kill him right there, to give him the day off so they would never have to even make it to the hill to crucify him. It said that sometimes the veins would be laid bare. And the very muscles, the sinews, and even bowels were open and exposed to the disease-ridden elements. But remember, no matter what the disease, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with these stripes, bowels hanging, we were healed of every disease. Even viruses, Christ heals us. Every orifice of his body is spewing blood. He's covered in his own fluids. What was in him is now on him. He's a bloodied mess. Remember Isaiah, he didn't even resemble a man. He was so marred. Many people would die from this beating alone but not Jesus. Remember, he was the God man. He had to get to that cross because the scripture says, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. He couldn't have died at the whipping post. He couldn't have. This was going to be one of those events that would seal his case as Lord forever because if he goes to that cross and if he dies on that cross, glory be to God, it fulfills the scripture for on the third day, he's got to get up again. If he dies before the cross, oh, it cancels his assignment. It denounces his, his, his claim to be God with us of being the Messiah so he had to go to the cross it, it puts those extra four digits on the address so we can specifically know that it was him on that torn open back now flayed like you would flay a fish he had to carry his own cross down that winding road called the Via Dolorosa the way of suffering they jeered him the abuse of the crowd the emotional trauma still waited on him it weighed him down. Can't you see him? Remember the sweat like drops of blood, but because of the psychological pressure and emotional pain that he was experiencing about what he had to go through. But here he is now going through it. And where's Peter? Where's James? Where's Sean? Where's my mother? All had forsaken him. Peter had denied him. He knew this. Oh, oh, where's Lazarus? Where's the blind man? Where's the woman that was caught in adultery? Where are the lepers? Where are the people that had seen? Where's the demoniac of Gadara? He's left to himself and he's carrying this cross. He's physically drained, emotionally drained so much that he falls beneath the weight of the cross, the weight of defection and the weight of the physical cross itself. So much so that somebody in the crowd is summoned to help him, help him carry his cross. 
Must Jesus bear this cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for you. There's a cross for me. But he never intends for you to bear it alone. He didn't even bear his own alone. So he's given us another comforter, the Holy Ghost. And even right now, when the emotional stress is too great, when the psychological pain is too great, when you feel all alone, when you're rejected, when people have defected, the comforter will help you bear your cross. He finally gets to the end of that trail and he winds up at the hill called Golgotha, the place of the storm. But it doesn't get any easier. The torture intensifies. You would think that's enough. Please, that's enough. Please, no more. I can't stand to look. I know he can't stand another thing. But it gets worse. There's a vertical beam already lying on the ground, waiting on its arrival. It's just laying there, waiting on the cross beam called the pantibulum. It, it is the crossbar that holds the victim into place. And he's laid on that beam. And then tapered nails are driven through his wrists, attaching him to that beam. He was nailed, the scripture says, in his hands. Some say his wrists, had it just been in his hands, he could have fallen off of the cross, rupturing the meaty nerve. Would have, it would have sent him insane. It's the most sensitive of nerves in the body. So many believe that the nails had to go through his wrists to hold him up. So he's nailed ah, on the cross. He's nailed ah, on the cross. The way he was hung and then phew, dropped in that hole would cause the nails to tear through his foot, eventually locking up against the tarsal bone. And the weight would be now on his legs. He's hung in the flex, but you got to see this. When he was dropped, it also caused both shoulders to become dislocated. He would have been snatched six inches in both directions. In both directions. And there he is. Unable to pull up with his torso. Only able to push up off of his legs. He was hung in the flex. So that in order to get air, he would have to push up. Oh, it hurts. His lungs are filling with, he's got to push up to catch some air, but as he pushes up, the pain gets worse and worse. He's in agony. He's in agony. He's dying the slow death of asphyxiation. The carbon dioxide in the blood dissolves as carbonic acid, causing the acidity of the blood to increase, leading to a serious irregular heartbeat where the heart is trying to keep up with the trauma. He can't. He can't. It's Jesus. It's Mary's baby. It's the Lamb of God. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. But even as he's hanging on that tree, he's in agony. And even on the tree, he forgives. He saves. He cares for others. He addresses his father. He admits to being human. He announces the job is finished. And even on his own power on that cross with all the rest, he releases his own spirit. Many tonight are declaring the seven last words of Jesus. And they're famous. Number one, he said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He forgave those. Had they known, the Bible said, who he was, they would not have crucified him. And not because out of respect, but brethren, them that didn't want him to be who he was, they would have known that if they did kill him, that it wouldn't be the end of him. So he says, Father, they did it in ignorance and in unbelief. Number two, he said, today... You will be with me 
in paradise. He said to the thief that was on the cross that today he would be with him in paradise. It's never too late. It's never too late. Jesus on the cross. He's about to die. And he's still saving. He looks and he sees his mother carrying from the cross. And he says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. John was given charge to take care of Mary. Mary made her way to that. Can you imagine a mother seeing her son hanging there, bows out? Send you tissue bustle draped, hanging like rag, bloodied, what's on the inside of him, on the outside of him, unrecognizable. She who he gave birth to, she gave birth to him. She weaned him. She sucked him. And then he said, that's my mother, but Joseph ain't my father. He cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That wasn't for him. That was for those that around him. He cried out to the father. But the Bible says in the back of that father's eyes are too pure as to behold iniquity. And for that fleeing moment, he who knew no sin had become sin. So he said, get your theology straight in the end. God's eyes are still too pure as to behold sin. So we have to be washed in the blood. That's what propitiation is all about, to make us right with God. So that when he sees us, he sees the resurrected Christ. Then, being human, it stands to reason. He said, I thirst. It's just natural. I thirst. It had been a long day. They offered him gall. They offered him vinegar. They offered him something. And someone said it's medicinal. It would take away the pain. Not that pain. He refused it. And then he said, it is finished. It is finished. Now remember, there's an irregular heartbeat. I've had super ventricular, ventricular tachycardia, and I've laid on airport floor. I've been shot with something to make my heart stop, with the paddles there to make my heart start again, because my heartbeat was so irregular, I thought I was going to die. And with this irregular heartbeat of Jesus, you got to understand what this was. This became his signal to him when it was about time for him to die. And so as the heart began to slow down and as the heart began to weaken and as the beast became farther and farther apart, he was able with his last breath to say, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. And there, died. Doctors tell us that he died of cardiac arrest. The spirit tells me that he died of a broken heart. That night was gruesome, but now we know why he died to save us from our sins. We know what it did for us. It gave us power to live for him. And we know how he did it too. He died. Didn't he die? He was hung out on that tree. He was hung up for our hangups. He died. The gospel is not complete because the scriptures do say, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. But he had to die. They took him down and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But keep in mind, there's good news. When he said, it is finished, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, I've done what I purposed to do. I came to destroy the works of the devil. And on that cross, he did. This is Friday. But don't forget that Sunday is a coming. God bless you. See you Sunday.